Welcome to this interview in our Roads Ahead series, focused on thought leadership in the Roads community. I'm Elizabeth Keish, Warden of Roads House, and I am delighted today to have the opportunity to speak with Dr. Anita Mehta, who is of India and St. Catharines, 1978, and she has just returned to Oxford as the Leverhulme Visiting Professor of Linguistics, Philology, and Phonetics here in Oxford. So Anita, welcome back to Oxford. Delighted to be here, well, we're to be so, talking to you. So yeah. glad to have you here. Now I noticed that when you applied for the Rhodes, you were picked for physics, music, and creative writing. So that's a really interesting combination. How do you pull together the sciences and art in your, in your work? Well, in my case, unfortunately, most naturally. <laughs> I wasn't born with a brain divide, which in fact has um, caused various problems in various professional spheres where people expect you to be totally focused on one at the expense of the other. Um, and um, frankly, to begin to just go a little further back, in my day, it was known that you had to be an athlete and uh, an academic. I knew I didn't have any athletics, so I just put in what I love to do, which is the other stuff. So I was really shocked when I got selected. Um, and, but I must say, in, uh, here in Oxford, it was very welcome uh, in the sense that one of my tutors uh, said, this is your physics appointment, but he was a, phys uh, a pianist as well. So he said, and this is your music assignment. And so in Oxford, I felt very well as, a, as an undergraduate. Uh, in this, in what I had always been taught to think of, and certainly in the years that followed, um, almost commanded to think of as a real divide. For me, I love languages. I love to write. Um, I love to read, obviously. Um, I love to play and listen to music. And I completely um, uh, subscribe to what I would call analytical thinking. However, uh, the one thing I'll add before I let you shoot is, 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 is that I think it's a mistake to think that analysis belongs to one and creativity to the other. Mm -hmm. Because as a pianist or as a musician, I find I use both halves of my brain. When I think about time signatures and so forth, it's very precise. And then you have to let yourself go. And in physics, which people, many people don't realize, you have to have the quantitative aspect, obviously. You have to reason logically. But at the same time, um, some of my best times in physics are when I dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I model natural phenomena as well as, you know, a variety of other things which we'll get onto later, um, I always dream of how a system works. So when I was working on sand, which was the first thing I did independently, um, I always had images in my mind of what would an avalanche be like. And for me, the mathematical stuff in that case follows the vision. So both sciences and the arts mm. involve both rigorous and analytical as well as creative and imaginary, imaginative thinking. Um, and I think for that reason also, it's a mistake to say it, you have to be one and not the other. I love that. So. I love that. Yeah, no, that's a, it's very helpful to break down that sort of stereotype. Mm. So tell us more about the field of physics that you, that you work with. So uh, the, the best way to describe myself as a statistical physicist is to say, uh, I am, I hope, a good carpenter rather than a bad one, but a, a carpenter who doesn't blame her tools, but who actually uses them to um, attack a different, uh, different disciplines. So as statistical physicists, all we need or we ask is that a system should be large because you can't do statistics on three people or five objects. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, either you have to learn about whatever field it is, and it could be in economics, I've done stuff on trade and finance and stuff like this. Um, it could be in neuroscience, some of my work has been on long-term memory. It could be in what people consider natural systems such as sand, mm -hmm. the flow of sand, avalanches and sand and so forth, or indeed, languages, which are in fact one of the most complex systems there is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say what I mean by a complex system in a minute, but for the moment I just say a statistical physicist takes systems and analyzes them. And sometimes, as in the case of sand, I had to learn about everything. But sometimes you luck into situations like I have here, where you're dealing with people who know all there is to know about the field. Of course you have to be interested enough 
to learn some of it, the bit that you need, but you can ask them what those bits are. And of course you read around and if you enjoy the field, you do that. Um, and then you have to know enough to be able to ask quantitative questions um, and then with any luck produce reasonable answers. But you really are shining a light on different systems. And again, the only other thing I want to add is that one of the things that's very um, topical in physics and I guess in the world now is the study of what are known as complex systems. Mm -hmm. And this is not just meant to say that they're difficult. I mean, complexity has a technical meaning. So typically, these are systems where, if I had to say something broadly, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. So if I were to take a room full of individuals, then let's say the collective opinion on something that would emerge is not just the sum of all their opinions, but it could be something collaborative mm -hmm. that emerges as a result of their interactions. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the important things. The other things about complex systems are they, are, they have memory in uh, the conventional sense as well as otherwise. So for example, if you think about it, you leave a footprint on the sand mm -hmm. because sand is a system with memory. You don't leave a footprint on water. Oh, wow. So, so you know, there are certain characteristics, and I've just mm -hmm. given you two of them. Emergence is one, where the whole is more than some of its parts. Memory is another. Mm -hmm. But there are several of these characteristics, and most interesting systems in our world show signs of most of these features. So the technical title for what I and many others do is we are statistical physicists of complex systems, because they are obviously the more interesting ones. Right, right. So how did you get interested in sand? I've always been interested in sand, so I just I love that that was one um, of your one of the uh, things you focused on. The, the on the, this two, there's two answers. There's the honest answer is because I'm a contrarian. I'll tell you why <laughs> in a minute. But, but then there's also a, a technical answer. But I'll give you the contrary reason first. I um, did a wonderful postdoc in Cambridge with. Um, the late Sir Sam Edwards, who uh, was a brilliant physicist, but the best thing about him was that he set me free. Mm -hmm. He never asked that I do X or Y. He said, oh, just go away and do something. And the two topics that were then being discussed uh, at the Cavendish Laboratory where I was were electronic structure and polymers which in my humble opinion had been done to death so that lots of people were experts on very small bits of it, you know. And I'm hopeless at following rules. So I just wanted to be somewhere where I could make my own rules up and then of course test them against nature. Mm -hmm. And around, uh, you know, I, I sort of fiddled with things, ideas for about a year and then I suddenly lucked into this because somebody made a theory of physics where he used the wrong paradigm that was sand and he said you know sand is an example of this theory and I started looking at sand and I said it isn't mm -hmm. and I, I confronted him on on this um, at my cost I guess <laughs> in some ways and I continued to do that for a number of years and I remember in my initial years I was called because it wasn't taken seriously I was called that sand pile woman accent on woman yes. yeah <laughs> and um, and and I was glad that at the end of my four years in Cambridge, people took the field seriously enough that there were beginning to be parallel sessions in various meetings. So I was one of the first people in the field and I took a lot of the shtick. But on the other hand, you know, um, it was a lot of fun in the early days. Um, just thinking, I mean, I, I could imagine, does it really flow like this or like that? And sort of dealing with experimentalists and saying, you know, I think it does this. Can you check that? Can you verify or falsify me? Mm -hmm. Because in my case, um, I'm not one of these physicists who wants the world to fit their model. Mm -hmm. I'm very humbled by nature or by systems. And I just want someone to test, to test what I am. And if I'm wrong, that's it. I, I think again. Um, but that kind of sim symbiotic relationship with different experimental groups, and at that point it was, you know, the people that I was dealing with were in Paris and Chicago, it was fabulous. And it was just a playing field of ideas. And so the technical reason why then went to sand is exactly because it is a complex system. Yes. It's something which, if you think about it, it packs like a solid, you can make it stand, and it flows like a liquid. Mm -hmm. It can fly like a gas, mm -hmm. yeah? Because if you shake it, it can fly. You can leave footprints in it. And there's a very simple physical reason for why that's the case, and I, we might talk about that later. But the fact is that it's because it has memory, because it has these different states, uh, because so much is not understood even now, although many, many of the basic ideas have been discussed, um, and I think understood um, in the years since we first started this. Um, 
that's what fascinated me. And I, th I thought, wow, this is a playing field. I mean, I can just let ideas rip. Wow. And, and then how did you shift from sand to long-term memory? Okay. So that's to do with something else. I am deeply restless and very impatient. And I'm most impatient with myself. So um, at one point in my life, when I people thought I was at the helm of, of my work on sand and I was always getting invited to X and Y conferences and doing stuff, and I found myself getting terribly bored because people were discussing details and this was no longer the field that I'd entered. And now the third decimal place mattered mm -hmm. and it's never mattered to me. You know, and um, at this time, roughly, I went to um, Harvard. I got a Ratcliffe Fellowship. And I was, it was wonderful. I mean, I was embedded in this uh, network of people who were uh, doing very different things, including, um, at that point, artificial intelligence. And I subsequently learned from one of them, and I, that's become one of my interests in a very, uh, at least in a minor sense. Um, and it was there that um, I, I was looking around for stuff, and as I was talking to these artificial intelligence people, I thought, I would love to know why human intelligence works and memory was one was one example so initially it's always been a, a fascination of mine to, to you know to think that um, you know why do we remember why do we have long-term and short-term memory and I started corresponding with this man called Eric Kendall who is uh, who was one of the founders in the field of psychology of this and he was in New York and had a few email exchanges with them and I did all of this and then I said, look at me thinking about all of this, but I will never get a chance to test any of it because I don't know any neuroscientists. And so I began to think about it. And when I came back to India, I lucked into a grant in the cognitive sciences, which meant I could actually hire people who weren't just physicists, but who could do stuff in psychology or neuroscience or whatever. And that was the beginning. And it was very scary, as it was very scary being at the beginning of a new field like sand. But now I was older and it cost me more to fail. Mm -hmm. And so I thought um, it was edgy, but it was the only life I wanted to live. And so I, you know, I carried on uh, with that. And then with the years, things seemed uh, to fall a bit more into place. I got networked with uh, neuroscientists when I just, um, I happened to go on a trip to Calgary and I got involved with actual neuroscientists there who tested some of our models of memory. So all of this gave me more confidence and that was my next subject. And so now what we've done with that is we have a model of memory where, to put it bluntly, uh, we have a quantum model where for the first time, as they love to say in physics, and I don't like to say it, but I'm saying it, um, we have a model where long-term memory naturally emerges in a mathematical model, whereas before, the, the thing was that you could make mathematical models, but they would just say, it's short-term memory. So you can have very long short-term memory, but long-term memory is like remembering your name, mm. which you never forget. Mm. Yeah, it's not like remembering something from 10 years ago. That could still be long short-term memory. So we had this model and um, I would dearly love to put it on a computer because we've done the analytical stuff, but it would need a lot of firepower to put it on a computer to, to really make predictions, to really test it on people. But for the moment, the achievements are theoretical. And while I wait for some more interest in the practical realm, without which I will not be convinced that what we've done, even if it's elegant, and I won't be convinced that it's meaningful. Um, and then in the meanwhile, I worked on different complex systems and suddenly got, I, I, you know, I came across this thing on languages, wrote this grant, and I thought, this would be the next thing I would love to work on. And I didn't expect to get the leaf hume at all, mm -hmm. exactly as I didn't expect the roads. And here again, there was a very good reason, uh, and it was that I was told by everybody, don't bother, they don't give it to scientists because scientists have their own funding sources. Um, but I said, well, let's try anyway. And when I got the e email from Levy Hume, I just thought it was a hoax and I threw it away until my colleague in Oxford, who had co-written the proposal, called me and she said, did you get the email? I said, oh, that, I said, I threw it away. She said, no, she said, it's real. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> so here I am. So this is a new direction So this for is a new direction. You. Oh, how exciting. Very exciting. That is very exciting. And I, you know, I just, I, I love the ways in which you are, kind of a, a, you know, there are people who are serial entrepreneurs, you are a serial uh, trailblazer, you know, in, in applying the, 
the kind of the methods of statistical physics to entirely new areas. I mean, it's it's very exciting. That's, That's very, very exciting. Kind of you, you know, say, we, yeah. we have a, a Rhodes um, artificial intelligence lab. Mm -hmm. These are students who are very interested in in, uh, in AI. And I, I, you know, I was thinking to myself, well, maybe they could work on developing the computing power for you to test your your long-term memory uh, model. That's, that's, that's amazing. That really, would be lovely. I'd, yeah. lovely. I'd love it. Uh, I'd love to be in touch with them. Yeah. 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 Well, I definitely yeah. want you to speak to some of our mm. current scholars. So now tell us a bit about what you did. But, so you've told us some about kind of going to Cambridge. Was that right after Oxford? No, no, no. I um, After Oxford, I got... Um, uh, a job at uh, at IBM in New York, and I think it was probably f the first person to quit IBM, because um, uh, I hope I'm not breaking any rules when I say this, but I already felt that its downfall was imminent because mm -hmm. 10 out of 11 people, well, nine out of 11 people in our group uh, didn't do very much. Mm -hmm. And yet we had these wonderful salaries and country club facilities. I have to say I was very bored because I was doing something that another part of IBM had already done. Mm -hmm. So the right arm of, left, of, of IBM didn't know what the left arm was doing, so I was very bored with that. But then I thought to myself, you know, this can't be right. I mean, you can't have people doing this and getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. And against everybody's advice, I quit and I came back to Cambridge. Um, and then after Cambridge, I moved on to Birmingham, which personally was not such a good move for me. And for various reasons at that point, uh, my personal life developed in such a way that I went back to India, mm -hmm. where I stayed um, until now, mm -hmm. with two um, uh, long-term assignments um, and several short-term ones. But the two long-term ones were one, an EPSERC fellowship here in Oxford in um, 1993, and then uh, the Rattler Fellowship at Harvard. Mm -hmm. But what I always managed to do was at least for two or three months when India is at its hottest, I would get away to Europe, <laughs> typically, <laughs> typically to Paris, and uh, more recently um, to Leipzig, mm -hmm. where I've collaborated with whom I've worked for the last decade. So you've worked with collaborators all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, Including um, China. Um, yes. China, Mexico. That's great. Um, Turkey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. So truly a global career in, uh, in, in physics and in all of these fields. So what are you going to be working on? You mentioned you, you want to now switch to looking at language. Mm -hmm. what, what's the project that you're working right. on? So now? Um, the project involves um, the fact that there's a very interesting approach to the perception of languages, which exists right now. My uh, colleague and the chair of linguistics, Professor Aditi Lahiri, is someone who has developed a model of uh, in language perception by features. I'll explain that very quickly. Normally, you, you take a word like alphabet, alphabet, you develop it, you know, you divide it into phonemes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what, that's not universal because the division depends on the language. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you think of bits of words originating from different anatomical features, labial, nasal, mm -hmm. these are universal. Mm -hmm. So she's developed a scheme for uh, perception of languages by dividing sounds into features, which is the technical term for the, you know, the part of your an anatomy that it comes from. Yeah? Um, and there's a working computer program which does this, but what there isn't is a unifying physical theory. And you might ask, why do you want a physical theory? Well, the trouble with computer computers is that they can answer, they can give you data on a specific question, but they can't pose an abstract question and get a predictive answer, okay? So if you want that for aesthetic reasons, you do what, you know, you, you need a physicist or a mathematician. It, also for practical reasons, it's not possible to get a computer which will explore all of space, all of the face space, you know, mm -hmm. all different languages, all different sounds. There might be areas of particular interest to you. Mm -hmm. so the question is, with a theoretical model, can you actually highlight which are the features or which are the aspects of different languages which would be most relevant. So that's the Leverhulme project. Mm -hmm. This said, uh, what I'm also enjoying doing very much is looking at, they have a language lab, a language and brain lab. So their people are tested on their perception of different sounds. Let's say, how many people would get a word like, uh, I don't know, space time is a word, mm -hmm. but space time like is not a word. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see the limits of people's literacy or maybe the limits of language or, you know, how things come into usage or whatever, you get samples. 
as in people, um, who will sort of press a button if they recognize a word or a non-word or whatever. And then you have to do statistics on that. And that's another area in which I'm finding myself quite interested because there are ways in which I can use my box of tools mm. as a carpenter mm. to see if we can do these things in a more current way than perhaps they've been done in other disciplines. Wow. So, so is part the I'm, I'm interested in this uh, using the the kind of the universal physical elements of of language making. And I guess there are some languages that have very unique sounds, right? That are like clicking mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So, would you be also looking at that? Some of these more unusual, or or you're looking at more the kind of the universal sorts of nasal, etc. Et you know, I. Um, like Science. most physicists, um, we, we go very far away from the system mm -hmm. to begin with. So for me, uh, clicking and nasal and so on would all be part of a set, okay. which I would not label as click, nasal or whatever, okay. but I would label, label them by X and Y and Z and things like this. I would make a model. If it was any good, I would give values to those X and Y as nasal and label. And if it then worked, I would include more more aspects. But I'm one of these people who likes to reduce everything mm -hmm. to its most minimal state without losing the essence, which is, which is the part where dreaming comes in. What's the most important aspect of, uh, of a problem? What can you not do without? What can you do without and sweep under the rug? You know? So uh, you make this model and you test it in yourself and with your collaborator about a million times right. before you ever write anything about it. Right. When you write something about it, you then get it tested by, let's say, a group like they have to see if it's even meaningful. And if it isn't, you go back to the drawing board. So after this long process, and if it all works, we could put in exotic features. For the moment, I'm not labeling them as anything. They could be anything. Right. But the difference between what you call clicking and what you call nasal is that because our approach is probabilistic, I would say the clicking would occur with far less probability mm -hmm. than the nasal. Mm -hmm. So probably in a first brush, I would say, OK, it's less important because it's this. it would be there, but with very little probability. Mm -hmm. So tell me a bit more about kind of what's what what do you envision what problem or question do you envision answering about language through through using these tools and and what might be some of the practical implications of your of your work okay so i would say the practical uh, application is very much there as they're making an app Mm -hmm. where and this app would work in multiple languages and uh, it could take exotic languages and allow you to perceive and understand. I mean, it would be much better than Google Translate. It would, you know, allow you to switch between languages. That's something they're working on. Yes. I could never claim any credit for that. What I would try to do is, um, you, you might almost call it a step back. That, you know, if you have something that works, are there any general guiding principles? Mm -hmm. And I would do it for purely aesthetic reasons. That's how I presented it to, to the Levy Hume people. But in fact, there's always a reason because it's always possible that if you get the, a good theory, and there's a big if there because you never know if you've got it until you've got it, then you can shine a light on questions which possibly people haven't thought of in actual app design mm. or on computers. So it would have, as with all theoretical physics, a very much longer term impact, if any. Mm -hmm. And when you think of the number of decades, sometimes centuries, which pass between an idea, I mean, you know, when people talk about teleportation and stuff, stuff like this, it seemed the fact of, fan you know, of fiction, but now it's become real to do with quantum entanglement experiments. But people were thinking about this kind of thing a century ago. Yes. So, you know, who knows about practical applications? They're doing a very good job on that. But for me, it's always interesting to think, take a step back and say, if I were to look at it from a distance, what would it look like? How do I understand this I phenomena? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, fabulous. I love that. I love that. So now, will you be making some time while you're here in Oxford for your interests in music and in writing? Are you still juggling all of those elements of your, you know, what you're passionate about? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> so, 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 and the answer is yes and yes in the sense that I've already, you know, I've got back to playing, um, which I enjoy doing. And and what, um, what are you playing? The piano. Piano. It's great. Uh, the Somerville Chapel piano, to be precise. So it's, it's so handy. It's right next door. Um, 
but um, more seriously, it's uh, also an opportunity because I'm in this very flexible workplace that I was having a discussion about doing something on the mathematical modelling of harmony, which in a square physics department would be seen as a bit odd. Uh, but I was having this discussion with a professor of music in this university in front of my colleague and host here in Oxford, and she was quite excited about it. So I would like to use quantitative methods to probe the structure of harmony mm. as, as a research project. And that leaves my last thing. I mean, I have this, I have this novel, which was part of my Radcliffe uh, project, which is a darkly comic novel on the world of science and which has aspects of me too, although not entirely. Um, but it is, you know, it does relate to aspects of uh, women in science. Uh, that's what it's about. And I'm going to try to flog that to an agent. Wow. Well, mm. so incredibly exciting. Uh, exciting. Well, I don't know uh, if I'll have any now, luck. Now, you know, uh, uh, I know we we have to draw to a close pretty soon, but but uh, just a, uh, is is being bored the worst thing in the world for you? I, <laughs> I had a feeling that was. Uh, that, I'd rather uh, be dead. Yes. <laughs> Well, you, um, you certainly haven't been bored through your, your career, and what an extraordinary career of asking all kinds of creative questions uh, and, uh, and being such a trailblazer and, and an exciting uh, thought leader and, and woman in, in science. Uh, it's just been such a pleasure, Anita, to, to speak with you. Thank you so much for being part of Roads Ahead. I'm excited that you're here at Oxford. Last question, what does it feel like to be back in Oxford? I feel like a fish in water <laughs> after decades. That's wonderful. And thank you so, so much. Um, as I said before the interview, it's not that I'm excited to be back here, just that I'm excited to be back here and back talking to the warden, but that I'm talking to someone like you, who is one of the most, apart from being the first trailblazing woman warden of Rhodes House, is so fit for her role. You're terrific. It's been a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful speaking with you. And thank you all for joining us for this Roads Ahead Thought Leadership Conversation.